are the Headwaters uh, Association. Uh, we're very popular watershed. For you folks that don't know Schuylkill County, Schuylkill County is split in half. Half goes to the Chesapeake, half comes down here to the Delaware. We are definitely the headwaters. No water flows into Schuylkill County. All the water flows out. Kind of a unique place to live. Uh, the headwaters group was formed in uh, 1997, mainly by a bunch of guys from Trout Unlimited and hunters and anglers that just wanted to have a better uh, fun day out in, in the watershed. Hopefully this will work. It does. The headwaters of Schuylkill, uh, the Schuylkill River is located at Tuscarora Springs near the village of Tuscarora. Uh, this is approximately a half mile downstream at this location. The river is about three feet wide. This is right next to our one of our treatment systems. And the river winds down through uh, all of Schuylkill County to get down to Fort Clinton where it merges with the Little Schuylkill. You can see the difference between three foot wide and down here at the end of our county, the end of our watershed, it's a lot lighter. This line coming down through here, I don't know who figured this out. This part belongs to Berks County, that part belongs to Schuylkill County. <laughs> the line is going <coughs> north and south. I don't understand how they did that, but that's the way it works. Uh, and as you folks may know or may not know, a lot of our watershed up there is seriously impacted by uh, the legacy of past mining practices, uh, AMD, abandoned mine drainage uh, issues. It affects over 129 stream miles that are impacted and listed on the uh, impaired list. And those are our main focus of our efforts up there. It, you need to understand that uh, some of the issues here uh, with these abandoned mine drainage discharges, the ones that we work with are, are just that, abandoned mine drainage. They're not current issues. They're not geared by regulations that are out there in place now. These are all sites that when they passed the Clean Water Act in 1972, there were co-operators out there that decided that they could not meet the regulations and the standards that they were going to be required to do. So they just abandoned them. They said, we give up, we're going out of business. Uh, and so they left them behind for other folks to take care of. Volunteers like ourselves with uh, watershed groups or possibly the state. And here you can see the location of uh, the discharges in our area. This area right through here is what we call the southern anthracite field. It's the southernmost location of anthracite in Pennsylvania. Below, south of here, there is no anthracite at all or any coal, as a matter of fact. This portion here is known as the western middle field uh, area. But you can see it just cuts our county in half completely across there. You can see uh, on this map that there is a lot of impaired streams, a lot of impacted streams from AMD and some other issues. So, uh, when we first started, uh, Cherry Town was with the, she at that time was called the Schuylkill River Keeper. Some of you guys might remember that. Uh, she encouraged us as a watershed group to get out and learn more about our watershed, what's going on, what's happening, so we know where to go and what to do. Uh, we did an assessment on the main and west branch of the Schuylkill River in 2000. Uh, and that identified 100 sites that are out there that are could be classified as abandoned mine drainage issues. Okay. During that assessment, we came up with a, a number of priority sites, and, and these sites were selected from contaminant loadings and, and other issues, and also some local prejudice, if you might want to call it that. It's right in my backyard. This is one I want to take care of. So naturally, a lot of people want to take care of that one. So, uh, But we did that in 2000 on the main stem. And in 2001, we came back and we looked at the little school to do the same thing. And we identified another 60 sites uh, out there. And again, came up with some more priority sites, and most of these priority sites over here, again, were uh, local interest uh, driven, if I would say that. 
Okay, so we have this assessment, we know some things are going on, but there were some of us out there that were eager to get something done. You know, I would, by this time we're now into 2002, five years into existence, we've done all kinds of uh, things like how we're going to run this organization, who the president's going to be, how long he's going to be in, in office, and all that kind of crap. We made, collected all the data, and there were us that were saying, damn it, we're not doing nothing. Let's get something done. So uh, we got a small grant, and we built our first project called the Miner Grove Wetland. This basically, this area in through here, was nothing more than like a black desert, nothing but cold dirt there, just uh, sediment that had accumulated there on the inside bend of the river. Uh, we went in and made a wetland. Basically removed that material, lowered the flood plain, pretty much left it do its own thing. We planted some native uh, aquatic plants. It's about one acre. Takes a little water out of the west branch of the Schuylkill up at the top, puts it back in here, and all it does is fill around mm -hmm. some sediment and some metals. And for us, this was great. It was, a, it was an on-the-ground project. They were doing something. We're ready and fired up to do some more. So we got into a little more aggressive mode, and we did the auto primary. This was our first major project, if you call it that. This is about two and a half acres uh, geared towards actually trying to get iron out of the metal, out of the water. Uh, the water flows in down here, goes into this large sediment pond and then flows into wetlands and this was a very passive system and again our first effort and again we thought this was God's greatest gift. Uh, it still works the same way today. We, we do have about a 70% efficiency on this project and it's doing okay for what we do at the time. Now we're really starting to work and we're getting together with, with a whole bunch of people that we network with. And, and our organization, we're just a bunch of volunteers. We need some help along the way and, and, and we get that. We got a lot of networking opportunities with uh, a whole host of people, uh, mostly DEP mining folks, but also the USGS and OSM and Bureau of Abandoned Mine Line Reclamation folks. So we came up with this idea that we had uh, another place we wanted to work and we got the people together and we came up with this scheme of how to build a treatment system. This is our first effort at trying to add alkalinity to the water to uh, booster the pH and, and do a, a, a good job with that. The other ones were just designed to try to get iron or sediment out of the, out of the water. The uh, actual mine entrance is right here. This area through here is what's known as a limestone cell and an oxic cell where the water goes through, dissolves the limestone and uh, adds calcium to the water and putting alkalinity into the water. The water that comes down here goes through these wetlands to go back out. Uh, this was a, one of, a very good learning process for us. We learned how this limestone stuff works, but also we learned the need that these things have to be scaled properly. Uh, this particular system, again, is about a one and a half acres. Uh, where it was the only place we had a, an opportunity to do the work. But, we can only take a small portion of the, the discharge. So we're only capturing maybe 20 or 30 percent of the water coming out of the discharge and that's what we're treating. But we looked at it like, okay, that's what we can do, that's what we're gonna do. You know, but really, it wasn't the best way to do things. But it's still in the learning curve. In 2005, uh, a lot of you folks might know about the Gregory and Greener process of the EPA and all that stuff and the grants and everything. There's a lot of people out there looking at what's going on around the state. And uh, there were some watershed groups that did not do a good job. They did not put the, do all their homework and put a good project on the ground and stuff like that. And there were a lot of folks that were looking at this and say, hey, we need to have better plan to how we're gonna do this work. And, and 
move forward. Uh, so the folks from EPA, OSM, DEP came to us and said, actually they came to 12 watershed groups within the state and said, you need to put together a watershed implementation plan. How are you effectively, efficiently going to work on these discharges? You got 160 discharges, how are you going to do it that we get the most bang for our buck? And, and uh, they, like I said, they, they encouraged us, they helped us along the way to put the plans together. And so we had to take all of our data, bring it together, get as much other data as we could, put it all into one package and come up with a plan. And some of these priorities are still some of the same ones that we had originally, but these priorities change a little bit. We got high priority loadings, some medium ones. We still had the opportunity to keep some in there that the locals were really interested in getting done in their backyard. Okay. So we're putting all that information together and again, one of the things that even though we have this plan of how we're going to do this work, we're going to start the watershed implementation plan says we're going to start at the top of the watershed and work our way down through. We're going to address this one first, then go down to the next one, and we have it all by plan. Uh, in theory, that's the best way to do it, and you'll see later that is a good way to do it. But along the way in our work, sometimes there are opportunities come forward that make it imperative that you go at something different. Uh, pine forest, the, the moving strategy behind this one was the co-operator was fine. He had to uh, actually address this discharge in order to uh, clear itself out with the uh, DEP or come to us and help us do it. It came to a point where it was a, a, a partnership effort where the co-operator came to us and said, uh, we need to do this work up here. We don't understand how to do it. How would you put it together? So uh, we got together with the co-operator. We got targeted watershed initiative grant was run through uh, the partnership for Delaware Estuary and Scoop Action Network folks. Uh, and also OSM money uh, together to build this system, which again, is it according to plan, but the opportunity was there to do it. And we put this one together in uh, 2007, eight, somewhere around that neighborhood. It's about five and a half acres. This system is uh, started working very well uh, for about five months pine forest system. It worked for about five months and it started failing. And we had some real serious issues. Here we got a project that I put $800,000 on the ground and it's failing. And uh, my biggest concern was that we were dead in the water. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to give me money again. You know, I spent all this money and I got a problem. So it took us about a year and a half to uh, figure out how to better operate the system. We uh, lucked out, we got uh, some <coughs> samples of some, some of the water and some of the things that were happening there. We went to Stroud Water Research. They identified our issue as Gallianella. It's a bacteria, an iron reducing bacteria that actually was clogging the system. So with that information, we went back to the drawing board and talked to our folks with Bammer and USGS and everybody else, figured out how to maintain the system with a, a standard flushing schedule and everything else. The pine forest is really working well now. The wetlands have developed. Uh, currently, the iron uh, coming into the system is about uh, 12, I think, 12 parts per million. Going out is one. And currently, we're removing somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 ton of iron out of that water every year. Okay. This is Silver Creek. Silver Creek is almost a, a sister to Pine Forest. Uh, two different line pools, but the water quality was very similar. Uh, it, but having the knowledge of what happened to Pine Forest, I definitely was not going to go back and put the same system in here that I put in at Pine Forest. Uh, 
there are only two of us up there to do the maintenance, and it's a full-time occupation doing all the work that we do and, and adding more maintenance to it. I didn't want to see happen. So we built this as our largest one to scale. And again, this isn't directly in line with the whip because we're not at the top of the watershed. But there was an opportunity here. The landowner permission is a big thing. This is eight acres, the whole treatment system. The whole area encompasses 10, but they decided the treatment system is eight acres. But <coughs> the coal operator wanted to remove that coal over there. And where he had a fear of if he removed that coal and he opened up a discharge, what was going to happen? I got this system built. If he takes that coal away and he's got a problem with his water, he can redirect his water back over here and go through the system that's now taken care of. It eliminates a big liability for him. Okay. Uh, and we have that in the agreement with the co-operator for permission to use his land should he do that where he would impact the water over there, he could bring his water through the system and he would also take over maintenance. That's a big key. When you're a voluntary group and somebody offered to take over maintenance on a long-term basis, you know, those, that's important. Again, this system, uh, <laughs> this is, we love showing this picture. This is, this is how we wish everything would look. Uh, the discharge actually starts up here at the top, comes down to a surge pool. This is iron dropping out, mm -hmm. and this is crystal clear blue, water. clear water. Beautiful. And we knew that wasn't going to last. Mm -hmm. uh, that that picture is about five months into the project, and uh, it's a poster child, I guess. Today, uh, what you would see is you can't contain all the iron. It just isn't going to happen. And it doesn't take very much iron to start staining the bottom. Okay, So if you get up there today, you would see that these pools are also orange. The result is coming out of the bottom, the water quality itself is the important thing. Again, we're down around one uh, part per million for iron going out. This system is taking out 43 tons of iron a year. Totally passive. So we did the big projects, but there were also some other things going on. We have a, a whole lot of issues up there. And part of it is, okay, maybe we can keep the water clean. Let's not let it get polluted before we have to work on it. It'd be a whole hell of a lot easier, right? So this uh, little project we did in Mackeysburg, the water was actually cascading down into this area and it would go down through what we call crop falls. You folks might know it as subsidence. The actual roof of the mine collapsed down into the mine, and it makes these big voids, big hollow spaces. All this stormwater runoff coming off the highway and stuff is going down to these holes where two, three days later it would infiltrate down into the mine pool to come out polluted. Right? We did a simple project. It's two different pictures, actually. Drop inlet box pipe the water over to the stream channel. This one we created a swale. Did the same thing. Keep the water above ground. It's not polluted. Not a major project, but it's a little part of the puzzle. This is another abatement project. Some of you folks might have seen some of my presentations before. This uh, reach of the wheeler runs about 300 feet long. The miners knew that this was an area where the water also went down into the mine pool through the stream channel, and they had built a wooden flume. That wooden flume was above the ground, kept the water out, off of that area. The water did not seep down into the mine pool. The, over the years, that flume failed, and the water was hitting the ground and going down in. We re secured the bottom, and we, we uh, restored the stream channel going up through there. It might not be the best as far as uh, fluvial geomorphology, natural stream design, and all that kind of stuff. But the main issue here was we're keeping the water above ground. And this stream used to run dry below here. So we have water going down through there all year round. This was another project, that's another abatement project in very high waters. The, the stream channel simply overtopped its banks. 
came down, eroded this big, massive area before it went down in a stripping pit. They become uh, polluted again in the mine pool. We simply secured the stream banks and prevented that from happening. This was a, another small project happening at the same time, Glendower Breach. Uh, you guys all know, remember the 2006 floods? The stream channel came down through, it blew out a small pond, diverted the stream channel down into what we call a slush pond. You can see all the material that was gouged out and sent down the west branch of the Schuylkill. Uh, every time it rained after 2006, it was eroding more of the sediment down into the river. Okay. Basically, all we did was restore the stream channel, prevented that sediment issue from happening. It all sounds simple. That's one hundred sixty thousand dollars. So. Those are all things that we did in the past, and I'll bring you up to date to where we are with some of <coughs> our recent activity. This is Bell Collery. Bell Collery was actually done by the Schuylkill Conservation District about 2004, somewhere around there, Tom, something like that. Uh, was one of our first really neat technical projects. Uh, it worked uh, very good. <coughs> one thing to mention is that this AMD work that we're doing. The science behind this is probably about 30 years old. This is relatively new, young. Everybody in the world got their own idea how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, every scientist, every engineer would come up with a different game plan. When this was first put together, this was what we call a, a uh, downflow structure. The water came in the limestone cell and went down through the limestone to uh, dissolve it calcium and stuff like that. It worked pretty good for a number of years and we did a couple different projects on it, but it, it was doomed for failure. We could not flush out that limestone properly and that limestone started to clog up more and more until just about two years ago it really it really was not effective at all. Schuylkill Conservation District went in and got a, a grant and uh, what we did was remove all of this limestone in here that was clogged and stuff. Uh, this was a crew mostly that did all the work as far as paperwork and contractors and everything else. As you can see, we just put it online back in September. We removed all that old stuff, put new stuff in. Now the system is the way we think is a better way of doing things. We capture the water here, it goes in the pipes, the water comes up from the bottom. Okay, so then when I go out once a week, we do this. <laughs> we go out and we flush it, we open these valves, so this water that's here is what we call head pressure, pushes back down. So if you can imagine when the water coming in from the bottom, the, all the iron settling in here in the bottom. So now when we've got water up here on top, we're pushing away from the limestone, preventing the limestone from being clogged. Uh, we, Tom can tell you this, along the way there's these are a lot of things you got to learn on your own. Nobody comes out and tells you this kind of stuff. Here's the monitoring data. Let me show you what we've been doing with the system since then. Uh, this flow is a little bit low. Uh, we folks are working in the water. You might have uh, recognized over the last couple months at the end of the year, the water was really getting low here. It was really dry period. Yeah, it was only in December, January when we started getting water back again. Uh, so that flow might be a little low. And you can see here, the iron is not really very high. Three parts per million is, is not bad, really. It's, it, for us, it's good. Uh, pH is the main thing here, 4.3. That, that's not good. So uh, we're treating this system basically to try to raise the pH. We do that to run it up to seven. Uh, the iron comes out at one. And you can see 3,500 pounds of iron a year. We're not really after the iron. We're really concerned with pH here because this system, going according to the whip, this is our first discharge in the headwaters. We've got the headwaters, we come a half mile down, we hit this discharge. At this point here, this discharge 
equals the volume of the water that's in the river. So you can understand what the greater impact is here because it's one-to-one -one ratio. You know, we don't, we don't want to really impact the river at this point. Directly downstream is the next one in the line. Again, going by the watershed implementation plan, this is the Mary D. Borehole. This project took me seven years to accomplish. When you first start looking at this, this is the old, what we call the old Mary D. Ball field. This was the only place that we could treat this water. The only place that's available. The, the discharge is right up in here, from down along the road, the river runs right along here. There is no other place. You got If you're gonna do it, you gotta do it there. So how do we do this with a recreation field there? It's not easy. We had to build them a new recreation field. Okay, that was our first step. They weren't gonna budge. As ugly as that looked, they weren't gonna let us work there until they had something else. We started our network in action. We got a cooperator to graciously give us 10 acres of land, donate 10 acres of land for this uh, project. We went out and got funding, uh, William Penn funding. I would <coughs> gladly put a plug in for them. They were, if it wouldn't have been for them stepping up to the plate, it never would have happened. We built the ball field, soccer field, walking path around it. We even got a little area over there for flooding in the winter time for ice skating and stuff. But because that was in place, then we could build this. Okay, this is our treatment system at Mary D. Borehole. It just went online as you saw it June of last year. Uh, this water comes in here, deep settling pond, wetlands, and a limestone cell. Again, the river is right here where the water goes back in. This discharge is a little bit bigger than the other one. Okay, about three times as much. The iron's a lot more. pH is a little better coming out of the discharge here. But there you can see the results. Again, we're at pH 7.5, iron down to one. Now we're at five and a half ton of iron a year coming out of this discharge. Okay. But here's the important thing. Right up here is Tuscarora Springs. We have Bell Colliery, the river comes down, comes across here, and then comes back over this way. Bell Colliery is here, Mary D. Overflow is here with the Bammer Project, it's just a wetland system that they put together, and the Mary D. Borehole is here. These three, the flow out of those three triple the size of the river at this point. You know, Again, going back to that watershed implementation plan, we were urged to go back in and look at this. Where are you really going to have the impact on the river and where are you going to do the most good? So we're working right at the headwaters, sending good water downstream. Okay. Keep this in mind, right down here is what's known as Big Creek, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. Turn this over to Sierra. So one thing I just want to say, kind of based on what Bill just said, when we put the Mary D system online, we had a public tour in June, um, and we went out and looked at the system and sort of talked about how it functioned. functions. Um, but one thing that was really cool is, you know, out, as these systems go online, you really can see, besides the monitoring data, actual physical changes that occur. And we were lucky enough to see native trout in the stream, literally right where the discharge um, that was flowing through the system with entering the Schuylkill River. So things like that are really exciting to see actually native fish returning to the headwaters just downstream from these systems. Um, so I do outreach and education um, for the Schuylkill Headwaters Association. And Bill's kind of giving you an overview of how this organization's mission has evolved, sort of what physical um, systems have been designed and developed to mitigate impacts to the headwaters of the Schuylkill River. Um, and it really is an adaptive process, um, like Bill said. A lot, in a lot of ways, um, we, in addition to the Schuylkill Conservation District, are innovating these technologies and engineering these systems. And it is a learning process. You know, they do fail. We, we, we don't have all the science to be able to. Um, 
plan in advance and it is, a, it is an adaptive process and I'm going to talk about how in that process we've been able to engage more stakeholders in the headwaters and use our network of um, uh, the community, co local colleges and universities to help us sort of in that adaptive process. Um, and why and why it's important to share what we do. Um, so one thing I just want to talk about briefly, so a lot of these systems, as Bill mentioned, we have to negotiate landowner permission to be able to construct them to begin with. And a lot of the systems end up being on um, land that either is owned by current, current cooperations that are actively extracting or ones that they still own the land, and, but they haven't been actively extracting for maybe even decades or up to a century. Um, so it tends to be on land that's pretty tucked away from the public eye. Um, even if it is right behind a community, it might be gated because the cooperation owns it and they really have to restrict access for liability. Or it could just be in areas that, I mean, really people only engage that landscape if they're going to be ATVing or shooting target practice. So in order to bring people into our organization and make them aware of our mission, we really do have to have like proactive outreach in order for people to be aware of what we're doing. Um, and it's been a struggle despite, despite all of the many projects that um, Bill mentioned we've accomplished. There really is a lack of public awareness about the work that we're doing. And even if people drive by a system, they might not know, you know that it's there or what it's doing. And we have been putting signage out when we construct systems. But we're trying to bring the community to our system and um, offer more public tours. And recently, we've really been driving, um, sort of taking some of these systems and building environmental classrooms and kind of you know, shifting the focus not just on remediating water, but that this is actually a destination to take students to and learn about abandoned mine drainage and water quality impacts. Um, so we do do a lot of, we do uh, several public tours, but we also have a lot of um, local school groups and colleges and universities within the wider um, watershed. Um, lots of colleges and universities in the greater Philadelphia area that will drive up to the headwaters and will spend an entire day kind of going out to some of the projects that we've built and some of the sites that we haven't yet addressed that Bill mentioned on that priority list. So that um, you know, we can talk about hydrology, we can look at the impacts, we can go to a crop fall and look at a discharge and then take them to a system and really have a conversation about what the issues are and how we're addressing them in physical ways. So I just want to return to Silver Creek. You've seen this photo before, but this is sort of our premier site for driving outreach and education. Um, last fall, we had over 125 students um, at the Silver Creek um, treatment system, and we're currently working on securing grants and more capacity to develop this as, as a recreational park and environmental science trail. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've done here to accomplish that goal. Um, Silver Creek, so, Silver Creek runs along here. Before we built the system, this discharge flowed straight into it. Um, but New Philadelphia community down here, we're involving them in the process. And we've constructed a walking trail that runs around this treatment system. Um, it's, I think it's a 0.8 mile trail. So um, there's a lot of community members that are starting to use that. We've installed educational signage about um, the impacts of uh, coal and the legacy of coal. Um, especially these pre-Clean Water Act sites that organizations like us are really the only ones you, leveraging state grants to address. And you can see we have, here's an example of one of the signs. So we start up at the discharge looking at what the history of mining is in Schuylkill County, what the legacy impacts are, and then sp focusing specifically on this discharge, um, how the system functions. Um, and we're, we try to make it as relevant as possible to people who don't necessarily have a background in science so that they can still understand how the treatment system functions and how it impacts their local watershed. Yeah, so again, like I mentioned, the, these signs um, encircle the entire treatment system. And here, um, I believe this is talking about how we use, and Bill mentioned this, and um, kind of talking about the design of the systems using these small series of waterfalls to 
um, aerate the water um, so that we can drive off the CO2 and allow the um, iron oxide to settle out and that's really critical up here in the settling ponds and then so we pretty much walk people through the system of how it functions and then through the lower wetlands where you can see um, kind of using native, native wetland plants as, as filters in, in uh, mitigating water quality impacts. So, I mean, Otter Tours, this is a, a really great example visually for students and anybody in the public to see the impacts that we're having on the headwaters because we, we, we can take them right over to the settling pond and reach in and grab a handful of this iron sludge and, you know, talk to them about how people down in Philadelphia would be drinking this in their water. It would have to be filled, filtered out at, um, you know, extreme economic costs too. And if you know we're taking that out of the headwaters, so um, it doesn't it doesn't become an issue for all the miles of river and streams down downstream from us. So um, yeah, here at the at Silver Creek, and this there's a pretty um, significant flow here, but we're removing between 250 and 550 pounds of iron oxide every day. Um, and it was sort of through these initial tours where we had kids out at the site for an hour or two and realized that there would be, this was a, a really great site to kind of develop more long-term um, curriculum around and to be able to bring them out multiple times to do more, um, more dedicated examination of some of these issues. Um, and so this has all kind of emerged in the last six months, a year, um, sort of to going, stepping from those one hour, two hour tours for student groups to kind of having more engaged semester-long curriculum development. So actually, in this example, a teacher contacted us from the Pottsville High School, and she was concerned because with the new, um, I guess they're not that new, but the Keystone State Science Standards um, in Schuylkill County, um, student performance on science and the science component of the exam is about 20 to 21%. Um, are, are passing and meeting the requirements. So there's really, and that school specifically, her class was really struggling on making the environmental concepts that they were learning about relevant. So she contacted us about ways of developing more applied science education, taking a lot of the lessons that they were studying in class and applying it in the field. And so we worked with her to develop a semester long curriculum where we went into the class talk to them about the legacy of coal and anthracite mining extraction, which you it's hard to believe a lot of these kids literally live on top of mines and they have no idea about why the river is running orange. Um, so kind of giving them a larger overview and then we took them to Silver Creek, spent two hours doing a really um, intense tour of the system, talking about the design, how it functions, uh, down to a chemistry level. Um, of what hap is happening to water quality. And then we had them out there for a full day doing water quality testing um, and broke them into teams so that there were different groups kind of responsible for monitoring each of the pond, each of the ponds, and they kind of brought all that data together for a final conversation about water quality impacts, chemistry, and looking at the big picture of what we were doing at the Silver Creek system. Um, in addition to kind of evolving, uh, involving um, local high school students, middle school students into our programming, we've done other kinds of outreach. Um, the National Civilian Conservation Corps is a, uh, this is a program of AmeriCorps, and they have teams of um, high school graduates and a lot of like younger college age students that sign up for 11 to 12 months and they travel around a region of the United States doing service projects for different, um, different uh, nonprofit organizations. And so we hosted a team um, in, 2000, in April 2013 and had them work with us on developing Silver Creek into this environmental field classroom that we're really striving for. So um, what we ended up doing here was along the environmental trail that rings the Silver Creek treatment system, there, there's a lot of erosion because of the process of extraction. Soils get really compacted. There's very little organic material. So it takes a long time for any kind of forest or you know, even um, shrubs to regenerate and, and the, with lack of organic material and it's very silty. There's a lot of runoff and erosion. So we decided to do some demonstration rain gardens here um, and try to improve biodiversity. 
Um, so we, in over the course of three days, we planted over 3,000 native wetland plants, um, and we worked with one of the contractors that we had actually on the construction of the Mary D site come in and do put some firms in for us. So we had a series of three staggered rain gardens going down the swale along the treatment system, um, and had the, stu the students um, plant the rain gardens here. And this has been, um, after, we, after we put this in, we kind of build that into the program when we take students on tours. And it's led to multiple school districts in our county actually take the next step and pursue putting rain gardens onto their own campuses. So where field trips are sometimes challenging to get students out, out of the school, pay for buses, and some schools can do that more easily than others. So when we do tours, we also try to provide steps that the school district can take on their own property that's still relevant to conversations about water quality, stormwater runoff. So this was a, this is a, just some pictures of what that rain garden looked like um, several months later. And so in addition to kind of being a demonstration site, we really are bringing in a lot more biodiversity to these um, mine lands that, I mean, otherwise it could take 100 years and it may never return to a native hardwood forest. Um, we're not necessarily planting trees here, although we do a lot of tree plantings as well, but um, it's a great example for students to see, look around at the landscape and see how barren it looks how little biodiversity there is, and see with something this simple as bringing in compost and topsoil and adding some native plants that we can really kind of rebuild the ecosystem. So yeah, there's lots of cool examples of pollinators and we had um, tadpoles and the kids have fun looking at tracks in the mud. Um, and sort of along those lines, as we have more of these sites, like the rain garden is in place and the educational trail, we're engaging sort of a more diverse group of stakeholders and we do put a lot of energy into students um, but we worked with a local Cub Scout pack to they built 12 um, bluebird boxes for us and we installed them around Silver Creek so we're really trying to leverage local groups to kind of help take ownership of a project that will make Silver Creek more of an environmental field classroom and it's cool because as these local kids who maybe have never been to Silver Creek or have really seen the impacts of abandoned mine drainage, they come out here, they put up a bluebird box, they bring their whole family back to see it, and now they're all users of the Silver Creek Recreational Trail. So it's kind of cool to see that development. Um, another thing, kind of tying back to the initial mission of the Schuylkill Headwaters Association and what Bill has been talking about, in the construction and design of these treatment systems. How do we solve these problems? How do we be adaptive when they fail? And so through our stakeholder outreach, through those, the development of those rain gardens at Silver Creek, we came to know Aquascapes Incorporated, and they are a native a wetland nursery in Pipersville, Pennsylvania. And they provided the plants and gave us a lot of advice when we were initially building these rain gardens. But when they came out for a tour of Silver Creek, they became really interested in our systems and how we were using wetlands and native plants to filter water in the larger system and gave us a lot of advice on like plant selection and how to introduce more a more biodiverse palette of plants into the system. Um, and so actually their um, the owner of the of Aquascapes came out and he's he's donated tons of plants for us over the course of the last year to kind of experiment and pilot with planting different species in um, different parts of the system and sort of um, evaluating how successful they are and trying to figure out which plants can survive in these unusual environments with lower pH levels or um, less oxygen and trying to kind of leverage native plants that are already existing that are brought in by um, birds and waterfowl and are surviving, trying to figure out how we can introduce those into the new systems that we're building so it doesn't take 10 years for us to have a biodiverse wetland. So that's an example why we think and our, our mission is evolving into really stressing outreach as just as important to water quality because that's how we reach these individuals who can kind of give us that feedback of knowledge to make our systems more effective. So yeah, here's an example of um, with Aquascapes. We planted some smart weed and other native plants in, um, this is Silver Creek, those where the water is kind of rolling down into the next pond to try to figure out what can survive in these um, pretty gross environments. Um, but you know, they do help trap iron and they are, they make the systems more effective and 
um, from talking to them and kind of bringing them out to our new systems. It's exciting to see kind of what we can do based on their knowledge to make our systems more effective and really leverage the wetlands that have been, you know, filtering water and improving water quality in the natural world forever. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bill so he can sort of <coughs> finish up the, the talk about how through the outreach and through our history of doing projects, we're kind of bringing that into the present day and future plans. Uh, you just met Sierra, and I can't say enough about this young lady. Uh, and, and, and you saw that some of the direction we're now heading is a little bit different, more diverse. We're, we're reaching out with the outreach and, and education and stuff. She has taken us to different heights with uh, connecting us up with the teachers and all this other kind of thing. And, and we get focused in, when we're doing our work. And you, you saw all the stuff that we do with treatment systems and stuff, and we're running down that road all the time. It took her, bringing her along on the outside to open our eyes up a little bit. Getting back to the, tr the water quality and stuff like that. I mentioned uh, before, I said about where Big Creek was, the next one down from Mary D. Borehole. Uh, Big Creek, we got a cold water heritage grant to study Big Creek. Uh, we thought this might come out just exactly what we found. Uh, the stream channel is about three and a half miles long, starts in a stripping pit, uh, flows underground for about 100 yards and surfaces, uh, comes out. The, the uh, deal with the, the thing is that this watershed is completely forested. 99.9%. .9%. There are four houses at the very bottom of Big Creek that even impact the, the watershed at all. But all the rest is, is uh, completely forest. We study the, the whole watershed for water quality, macroinvertebrates, and fish to see what we could do to take care of this thing. Uh, this is sample point one. Years ago, you would have found this out to be the first and original drive-through car wash in Schuylkill County. <laughs> <laughs> they drove down here, parked in here, washed the vehicle, <coughs> drove out the other side. Okay. This point is at a bridge on what old Jewel and I. Uh, it's about 50 yards above the main stem of the school. This is what the stream really looks like. Forested, beautiful, free stone, it, it's just absolutely stunning up through there. I had some folks there from, uh, a few folks are from our area, WNEP uh, Channel 16, Outdoor Life. Uh, we're going to be on TV in another, not this Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, took them out to show them this stream. They wouldn't even bring their video equipment out because they said, well, that's a beautiful stream. Why would we want to look at that? <laughs> it is absolutely gorgeous. Crystal clear water. And we can show you streams like this up home where if the pH is low enough, it doesn't matter what's in there, what kind of aluminum's in there, iron or whatever. You'll look at it and you just, I want to go in there swimming. But it can be not good for you. This particular stream doesn't have any metals in it. The only problem with this stream is the pH. Definitely low pH water. Here's the data. Again, it's acidic, no iron, low pH all the way down through and so relatively simple for us to figure out how to fix. Looking at the macro <coughs> this is more proof that the thing is dead. You guys might know the IBI index. Unimpaired streams you want to have a number of 63 high quality you want to be up in the 80 someplace. There's our numbers. There's no macro in there at all hardly. There are a couple bugs here and there. Kind of weird there were some kind of uh, Stone flies, just at every site. I, I've seen this before. I don't understand that, but sometimes we see these kind of things. But relatively, no macro. I mean, it was the further up we went through the watershed, the more depressing it got. We saw one brook trout, and that was about 20 yards above the main stem, right below sample point one. So I'm thinking it came out of the main stem and swam up in there for cooler water or whatever. Frogs, crayfish, salamanders, the water quality doesn't seem to affect them near as much as it does other folks. I've seen frogs in the worst water you'd ever want to see, so, uh, but that's basically it. A couple years ago, we had an opportunity. I had some 
money laying in the pile I could play with a little bit. I had about thirty thousand uh, dollars. I had a contractor working for me at the time. We did a small project with putting some limestone into the stream channel up at the headwaters. We thought this was a, a no-brainer, simple thing to do. Um, and we, we monitored it for about two months. And like happens with us up there, the floods came 2011 and just blew it. All that $30,000 is scattered now down through the watershed, just blew it right away. Uh, we did learn a few valuable lessons. We, we know that the limestone addition can bring this stream back to uh, health. Uh, we also know that we have to worry about, really worry about stormwater up here where we want to do some work. Uh, so we have some clear ideas and, and uh, focus on how we want to move forward with this, and this will probably be uh, one of our next upcoming projects. Again, going back to the whip, it's the next step coming downstream. Again, this stream here, where it meets with the main stem, this stream alone is almost the same size as the river at that point. I told you before it was three times as much from the discharge as the river. Plus now we got this guy going in, and he's half the river that gets down to them. So as we're working down through, we're systematically trying to help it out. You may have heard me talk over there. I asked William Penn Foundation. I got some other ideas out there that I could really use some help with. This is a project that uh, kind of, again, outside of our focus. It is, it isn't. It's our watershed. I told you we go all the way down to Port Clinton. Schuylkill Haven's over here. Auburn, Port Clinton's down here. This is what I call the Schuylkill Basin Project. Years ago in the industrial age, there was a lot of coal ship downstream uh, on the canal, on railroads and things like that. There were not good mining regulations in the past. So uh, if there were heavy storms like we had 2006, 2011 and all that stuff, slush ponds and everything would break, all that stuff would flush down into the river and whatever, come on down through. Years ago there used to actually be dams on the river where guys would mine the river 24-7 to take the coal out of the river. And back then when we, we did coal, coal was mostly for residential use, so it was larger coal not stove, pea, rice, tells you the size of the stone, uh, coal. When they processed the coal, they were looking for those larger sizes. The smaller sizes was waste product to them at the time. They took it over and, and each of these sites is a, is a refuse pile. When you're dealing with coal, you need water. It's the best way to work with coal for cleaning and, 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 and processing it. They use a lot of water, so you locate near the river, you got a lot of water, right, and the coal was there. And then what they would do is they knew that this material someday might have some value with it because it had carbon in it, so they took it, they put it in these dewatering basins, which we effectively call slush ponds, okay. This is the location of those things down through there. I received, I received a grant to study these sites to identify how much material is in there and if there's any quality of material in there that could be economically uh, beneficial to use for removing that stuff, thereby restoring floodplain wetlands wildlife habitat. The site down here at Auburn is the one we just did. We did it about two months ago. We got in and, and checked it out. That slush dam breached in 2011, 2006. 2011, more of the material washed down the stream. This is the kind of material I'm talking about. This is a four-wheeler track. This cold dirt, nothing hardly grows on it, right? This particular site is site four. It's about 25 feet thick, just sitting there. All this material is located way outside the coal fields. It's 20, 25 miles away from a processing plant economics don't play into moving this stuff out of here. So you have to marry some kind of project together to, to help the economics to get it out of here that we can restore this, this site. And as I said, the, the, I hope we can see that. This is the Schuylkill River. 
this berm, I'm standing on top of the berm looking down. This is 20 foot thick, right? Down here at the bottom, this is water that's coming out the bottom of the berm. Doesn't take a genius to know that that thing is ready to go. That will breach in the next high water event. You know, all that coal resource, it's a resource. It's energy sitting there waiting to happen. Not all of it at one time, but it's going to start going into the river, migrating into the river, be wasted as a resource, but also polluting the river as well. So again, in my opinion, these are really good projects to go after to try to get that out of there. This probably encompasses about eight or ten acres. So if I can take that eight or ten acres, remove that material, restore that to a floodplain, I've just helped out the whole watershed. People like Auburn, not off the flow Auburn, Port Clinton, Hamburg, and folks down the river, you know, I'm going to help reduce flood impact and high water events. All six of them combined would be a major impact down the river. One last project that I'd like to tell you about, again, this is West Creek over on the western side of our watershed. Another one of those issues where the stream channel is going down through, water is infiltrating down through the ground into the mine pool to come out in another watershed about six miles away. It comes out polluted. Uh, we're working with Kutztown University to uh, test the bottom of the stream channel, find out where it might be uh, infiltrating into the ground. We'll secure those stream channels to keep the water above the ground. And keep Young lady's about ready to throw me out. <laughs> I hope I left some time for questions. If anybody uh, has any questions or wants to see me later. You have all this iron. Have you done any economies of scale in terms of the iron oxide and mining that out of the sediment ponds? Reuse, recycle. There have been some efforts out there to, to do that. The, uh, there, there are some challenges with that. Uh, Every discharge, every single discharge is different. And, and the quality of the iron that you get out of it is different. Some, some, you might get pure <coughs> iron, you might get iron with aluminum, you might get iron with aluminum with manganese. So there, those are issues that you have to come uh, to work with. The other thing is the stream. When, when you try to set up a recycle event like that, uh, you know, a contractor is going to want me to give him 10 ton a year kind of thing and stuff like that. So, But there are efforts like that out there and thankfully uh, DEP, uh, they're working on several active systems. Uh, active system is a lot more simple to gather the material in, in, in a manner that you can reuse it. And, and uh, an active system is similar to a sewage treatment plant. And just as you uh, produce sludge, in a certain quantity, you could do the same thing with iron if you were doing it actively. And therefore, then we might have a dedicated stream of iron that we could tap in and make it more beneficial for others to work with. Question for Sierra. Uh, have you been doing the educational work with Pottsville High School long enough that the teacher is showing improved scores as a consequence of the education? Yeah. yeah, well, so, so far we've only been working with them for one semester, but. Um, I, I, we actually were just approved for an AmeriCorps VISTA position to start this spring, and we're actively recruiting now. And in that report, we tried to document and ask the teacher for results. And she said that when uh, they, they have, they did like a testing before and after the series of workshops. And uh, as far as water quality awareness, understanding abandoned mine drainage, the students were had a 25 percent. Um, knowledge at the beginning and over 75 at the end. So there was significant in, in, input um, knowledge in that in the course of the semester. It was also a unique class because it wasn't it wasn't an accelerated class. It wasn't a low class. It was a very diverse class. Kids had very different backgrounds and knowledge of science and environmental issues in general. And a lot of the kids were at risk of dropping out of school or failing the entire semester. And she said that because of the applied education, all the kids that were at risk of failing were, you know, um, were able to go on to the next school year. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and we're looking to expand that program um, to work with other school districts to have a more extended long-term relationship with the Pottsville High School. 
and the Avista, the Vista position that we just secured and are actively recruiting for now is all focused on an entire entire three series of three years, but a Vista position, someone will come on board for a year to work on developing Silver Creek as an environmental field classroom and really leveraging local teacher support in determining sort of the direction that it evolves and what's needed, whether it's um, access to the ponds to collect water data or wildlife viewing platforms. Um, we're trying to work with local ecology clubs to do some assessments of um, biodiversity in the wetlands themselves. So we're really trying to push that and bring in more classes like the one at Pottsville and prove that applied education at sites like this can be really successful for um, improving student knowledge of environmental and especially with the Keystone standards and a lot of pressure that teachers are feeling in the classroom, we can prove that applied education can bring up test scores and link to link it to the standards. Um, we can get a lot more support and more kids on on um, on buses to do field trips. Yeah, you don't you talk about the test scores. You, you don't need that. You can if you get involved in this program. Uh, it, it, it's pretty neat. The first time we went in and we talked to the kids and. I was about ready to throw a eraser at one of the kids who was falling asleep and you know, and, uh, yeah, another lecture kind of thing and stuff like that. So they get out there in the field actually getting their hands muddy and stuff like that and you can start to see them. They, they were more vocal, they were more active, you can see they, they were energized. They were, it was a whole different world for most of these kids. And like I said, two different school districts that we took for an hour, two hour tours, they're actually, we, we've been working with them to leverage grants and they're putting great gardens in on their campuses. So besides a work around abandoned mine drainage, um, it's exciting to see schools taking action to around water quality more broadly. And what? Billy guys are doing some great work up there. Um, I grew up in a you know, mining family from uh, I'm from the Wilkesbury area in uh, Missouri County. And I know they have a lot of problems up there with acid mine drainage and you know, stream impairment. Are, are there any such projects going on up in that area that yeah. you might be aware of? Yeah, uh, there, there are different groups up there. FCAM, or Eastern Pennsylvania Coalition of Land Mine Land Reclamation, EPCAMR, uh, they're, they're doing work up in there. Uh, there. There are some folks actually looking at some larger projects to the, the uh, on an old porch. It's out in the middle of the river. Very difficult. It'll be a six million dollar project to take care of. Uh, and and Scoop River Bay, uh, Susquehanna River Basin Commission is doing a lot of active work up there. Uh, and DEP has split off some folks out of their Bammer program into a, another group and they're specifically working with water and stuff like that. So there is there's a lot of there's a lot of effort going on. Uh, yeah, just to mention numbers, these projects that we, we looked at here, we got over $4 million invested in this. Uh, in Schuylkill County alone, we're at $12 million. That's $4 million of my projects and $8 million around the rest of the county and stuff like that. But very expensive work, uh, but the numbers prove it. There's one third of the population in Pennsylvania gets their water from is it worth it? Yeah. I think it is. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay.